They are the, your favorite. Well, good morning, church. Good morning, Refuge. My name is Matt Malik, and this is my lovely, amazing wife, Deb. And we are going to be sharing together, doing like the tag team approach. We're taking a, a little break from our core value series. Originally, we had a guest speaker scheduled for this Sunday, so uh, that didn't work out. So are you uh, is stuck with us, okay? Anyway, um, should I share some humor? She's going to do the, like, family thing, the kids, the grandkids, and all that kind of as a way of The fake laughing at his jokes. Here we go. I, I don't know about that. <laughs> okay, why don't you tell about the kids? Oh, the kids. Every, okay. every mom, every grandma wants to talk about the kids, right? Am I, am I wrong? Well, we have four of them. One is in Florida, and actually it's his birthday today. So he's 26 years old, and it's 1030 in the morning. So 26 years ago, I was in labor. I'm not today. Hallelujah. <laughs> And um, he was born at 11.14 a.m. So there's a little trivia for the Malik family. So Daniel, his wife Amanda, they have two children, three-year-old and a one-year-old, and they are in Florida in Bradenton. And then we have Nathan and his wife. They live close to the Dells in a little town called Mauston. They have two little boys. And Tracy is, did I say Tracy? Okay. For some reason in my brain, I thought I said Amanda. He's not married to Amanda, too. <laughs> and then um, Michaela and Andy, and they're expecting their first little boy. His name is going to be Crew. And so Crew Everest. And he's um, the end of August. And then Mackenzie, our daughter, is in Australia. She's our baby, and she's like, over 9,000 miles away from us. I don't know why she thought she could do that, but she did. And so she's attending Hillsong College there for vocals. And so that's where everybody is, and this is where we are. Yeah, and we're glad that you're here today. And we're going to share some things that will be helpful. Actually, uh, the title of this message is The Grace of Life, and, and I'll tell you a little bit about that as we go to the Word. But uh, I found out... And this is a good statistic, and I'm, I'm sure you're going to appreciate it, honey. In a recent study, it was determined that couples with a similar sense of humor are more satisfied in their relationship. Now, I don't know if it has anything to do with the similar part, but anyway, that is a study. Okay. Anyway, there, are you ready for this? There was, there was a man sitting. With like his, he likes like the Three Stooges kind of humor. I see no, nothing funny about it. Okay, all right. So, well, uh, similarity I can ends. laugh at him laughing, though, because he laughs so hard at that stuff, and that's funny. <laughs> okay. Anyway. <laughs> she, she just interrupted my joke. That's okay, sorry. And, anyway, Start there was over. a man and his wife. They were sitting in the living room watching TV. And for whatever reason, the husband said, Honey, if I'm ever in a vegetative state... Um, I just want you to go and unplug that machine because I don't want to live that way. I don't want to be, indep I don't want to be dependent upon some kind of machine. And so she said, okay, honey, I can agree to that. Immediately she got up from her seat, walked up, and unplugged the TV. <laughs> yeah. And when I, when I think of my wife, I, I wonder, Deb, how... You can put up with me. You know, this woman has to put up with all my weaknesses, all of my faults, and all my challenges in life. But then it dawned on me that I have to put up with her, too. <laughs> so we're even, okay? And, and then I, I found someone in Deb who loves me enough to share her life with me. She loves me enough to have shared my last name. And she loves me enough to share her bathroom with me. So that's, that's pretty amazing. But we have a lot of bathrooms in our house for a reason. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we want to talk about the grace of life. And if you have your Bibles, we encourage you to open up to 1 Peter 3, 7. And we're going to actually read this in two different versions. First of all, the English Standard Version and then 
the New Life Translation. And something I want to address because the title of this message is The Grace of Life. And we want to unpack that concept of what is the grace of life. And really to simplify it, it's really walking in the favor of God's best that he has for us as his children, as his human beings. And in the marriage context, there's a grace of life that God has for us as married couples. But that grace of life extends beyond just marriage. It's in any relationship. And that grace is God's enabling power, helping us to navigate through life, taking hold of his principles and living the way he designed us to live. And so let's look at 1 Peter 1.7. And the first one here is from the English Standard Version. It says, likewise, husbands, and, and I need to stop there in a moment because the previous verses in the context of what we're reading is addressing uh, both husband and wife, but certain things are spoken to the wife. And, uh, and, and you can read that when you get home. But it's interesting because this is really speaking about the husband's responsibility. So personally, I take this verse very seriously. And, and my recommendation to men, especially husbands, for you to take this seriously as well. And so likewise, husbands, live, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Now, we're going to pause there for a moment. In no way does this imply that she is weak. Now, except that she may be weaker physically because you may be able to lift more and do more physical labor than her. But the concept here is to honor her and give consideration to her. Um, and then it goes on to say, since they are heirs with you in the grace of life. An heir is someone who is entitled to an inheritance, someone who shares what another has gathered for you to re release to you. And so God's releasing something to us. And as husband and wife, we're heirs together in this thing called the grace of life. And notice it says, so that your prayers may not be hindered. God wants every married couple to have a successful prayer life, that your prayers are not only heard but answered. Now, we're going to look at the same verse in the New Life Translation. And it reads in verse 7, in the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should so your prayers will not be hindered. Let's join our faith together as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity for Deb and I to share this message on the grace of life. Father, help us to be able to speak into situations that will bring encouragement to couples. Father, even singles that are desiring, Father, to find a relationship and build a meaningful relationship. Father, we thank you for allowing your truth to go forth in a way that can bring transformation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the things that we're going to talk about are roles. Because as a husband, I have certain roles that uh, the Bible spells out for me. And as a wife, Deb has certain roles that God places expectation on her. And so, Deb, go ahead. So when we think about marriage, and again, we're talking a lot about marriage, which is, I think, really good, especially if you're somebody who hasn't been a Christian or walking with God a long time, because I know before I was a Christian, I thought relationships were completely different than after I became a Christian because I didn't know what God's word said about relationships and so and about marriage and all that good stuff. And so, you know, when you think about the Bible, see that as your constitution for living. Like this is what I live according to. So in relationships and becoming one and and all that good stuff, God created us to have a covenant with one another. And so when I said I do to Matt and he said I do to me, that meant that we were like sealed forever in heaven. 
So God put his stamp on our relationship. And, you know, you can, you can get that through the court of law because, you know, the laws of the land are the same. Um, God honors those as well. But there's something different about joining your life together in a Christian bond of unity. And so that's something we encourage. And, and you know, we'll talk a little bit about becoming one through this, um, the, the conference, the seminar that we're having. Because I believe that every strong marriage you continue to work on. And working doesn't mean like it's this laborious kind of thing. It means you're spending time together. You're setting aside, aside time for each other and, and for building your relationship with each other. It certainly requires an effort and a commitment and a devotion. And all of that requires something of us. We can't just... You know, say, I do, get married, and all of a sudden feel, okay, I've, you know, I bagged my deer, I'm good. You know, I mean, that, that's the guy's concept. You know, they go out hunting, and, and pursuing a relationship is like going deer hunting. Once you get your deer, you're fine. You go home, and you sit back and do nothing. Well, you have to clean the deer and all that. But anyway, probably a bad example. <laughs> but that's concept. A lot of guys, they think, I'm married now, and they sit back and do nothing to invest and keep investing in that relationship. And that's where and they get And women in can do the same. Yeah. So, yeah. so we want to direct you to the scripture we see in Matthew uh, chapter 19. And Jesus addressed marriage. And he actually took his disciples because the, the concept and the issue came up in discussion about divorce and marriage and, and remarriage and all that. And so Jesus referred and reflected all the way back to the book of beginnings, the book of Genesis. And so we know that Jesus, as a reference point, spoke this concerning marriage. And so he went back to the beginning. And so in Matthew 19, verse, we'll start reading at verse 3. It says, And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? See, they were looking for a way out. They were looking because maybe they didn't like their wife or they were looking for an excuse to end the marriage. And, and sometimes in our culture today, we're looking for a reason or an excuse to end the relationship. And then he answered, Jesus answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, verse 5, and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, that's significant because that's speaking of unity. That's speaking of connection. That's becoming one in a spiritual sense and also a physical sense when the marriage is consummated. And then it goes on to say in verse 6, so they are no longer two but one flesh. So again, that's, Jesus reemphasizes that oneness, that becoming one. And then he says, what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. In other words, God's in this thing called marriage because God's joining the two and they become one. And from a believer's standpoint, from a Christian standpoint, we need to understand that concept that God's in this thing called marriage. It's not just the husband and the wife. We, and in society, God has been excluded or removed or pushed out of that relationship. So, your marriage and becoming one means being united as one. And I believe it's the closest relationship that can exist between two human beings. Now, even though we're different, we complement one another. You know, we are way different in a lot of ways. Maybe you can address some of that. I'd like I don't to hear want, what you have I don't to want, say, I don't right? want to get in trouble. <laughs> well, well, for one thing, she's definitely a planner. I'm more the vision. I get the vision, but I don't get the details. But she's very detailed. And um, I found out that if I don't pay attention to the details, I get in trouble. Um, not just with her, with, with everyone else, too. Okay. Well, you know, I guess we can go through our list of ways yep. that we were different from one another, but that's part of the complementing each other and, and your relationship with each other. You know, when you think of the things that drew you to the person that you're married to, 
like some of those things were like so awesome. And then you got married and you're like, oh, that's so annoying, right? <laughs> Although you don't have many of those at all. We don't have them, you know. <laughs> she just won't mention them here. <laughs> Um, but, you know, again, I think it's, it's always keeping in mind that the reason we're married, part of the reason we're married is because we complement one another. And I didn't have to wait until I got married to be a whole person. Right. I already was a whole person. <laughs> you know, and I think sometimes in church or, you know, marriage, when we're talking about that, Sometimes it can feel like, okay, I'm single, so like I'm half a person. I'm waiting for the other half to arrive or something like that. Like that's not how that works. We're whole because of who we are in Jesus Christ. But, you know, and, and so wholeness is a really, really important thing because you can be in a marriage and be super, super lonely because you don't share certain things together. So when we talk about marriages and marriages that end in divorce, you know, I, I'm somebody who believes that you can fight through anything, like fight, like not fight, fight, <laughs> but you can work together and, and you can forgive because we serve a forgiving God. You know, I think sometimes the, the things that can be those forks in the road for people, we're like, okay, I'm done with you. I I'm, I'm, want you out of my life. I'm starting over again can be things that can be fixed. And so don't be so quick to give up. You know, fight for the marriage that you have, for the person that you, you first fell in love with. Because guess what? That person is still there. There's something called the power of remembrance. And we, we talk with couples when they're having a hard time. You know, we'll say, think back to what first drew you to each other. There's power in that remembrance. You know, there's power in knowing that when I first saw him, I thought he was so handsome. Well, that's not exactly everything that drew me to you, but it helped. <laughs> you know? I'm glad. <laughs> um, but what first drew me to him was his humility, was his love for God, was thinking, oh, my gosh, whoever marries him is going to be so blessed because of how he loves God. So loving God is what drew me to him first. And so look for those kinds of things when, if you're single. Look for the God qualities in the person that you believe that God has for you. Maybe if I can just slip this in there. Really, what drew me to her was her love for God because I was a single pastor at the time, and I knew anybody that, that I was going to be connected with had to have a love for God just as strong as my love for him was because he needed to be first in their life. And so her other qualities, is as, ma as amazing as they are, uh, uh, really the most important was her love and commitment to Jesus Christ. Because um. that's always what will keep you together. <laughs> In Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You know, again, we're going to talk about culture things today because we can be surrounded by people who aren't like your cheerleaders for staying married, right? <laughs> you can be surrounded by people who are like, forget this marriage thing, like, why do you need to be married anyway? You know, we have to know, again, what God's Word says, and then renewing our mind to what God's Word says. Another translation, it's the New Revised Standard Version. Like, I really loved what this said. It said, don't let yourself be squeezed into the shape dictated by the present age. Gosh, you guys, you know, squeezed into what this present age has to offer us. And you know what? In 10 years... The present age is going to be way different than it is today. It's going to change. Mm -hmm. But, you know, God's word doesn't change. What he says about relationships, what he says about marriage, that stuff doesn't change. So be squeezed <laughs> into the renewing of your mind. Let your mind be renewed to what God's word says. Well, we need to be determined to let God mold us, not let the world mold us. 
So again, whether you're married or not, renew your mind. And the way we renew our mind is by knowing what God's Word says. You need to be in the Word. You know, I, I believe that the Word of God is so important. A passage, we don't have it on the slide, but Philippians 4, 8 talks about what we're to think on. It gives us the criteria for right thinking. Whatsoever is true, the Scripture says. And this is where we find truth, the source of truth in the Word of God. Whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever is of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's any praise, think on these things. Because a mind that's renewed to the Word of God, when your thinking is right, then your actions will follow suit. And, and, and because really what you think on establishes your belief system. And whatever becomes your belief system determines how you live and act out in life. And so that's so important. Uh, the Bible says in John 1, verse 1, in fact, uh, right, and this is an amazing passage because it's referring to the person of Christ, but Jesus is called the Word. So in, in John 1, verse 1 through 5, it says, In the beginning was the Word, that's referring to Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2, He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without him was not anything made that was made. So that identifies him as our creator. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In other words, darkness will never overcome light. If we go into a room, you turn the light switch on, there's no struggle for the light overpowering the darkness as poof, the darkness goes. Unless the bulb burns out, okay? <laughs> then you need another light bulb. But we live in a world of darkness. We live in a world where uh, God isn't maybe seen as the ultimate truth. And you know, the question is, what is truth? That question was asked uh, by Pontius Pilate to Jesus. What is truth? And, and Jesus identifies himself as truth in John 14, 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. And Jesus is the word, 1 John, uh, John 1, 14, says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus is the living word. And so uh, that when you look at the, the Bible, uh, there's actually two references to Scripture. There's logos, which is the written word. There's rhema, which is the spoken word. And logos is, means that which appeals to the intellect, but also to the heart, because the word has a place to impact and change the heart. The word of God, we can call divine intelligence, okay, which brings order to chaos, which brings peace to destruction and love to hatred. It brings everything good into everything that's bad and wrong. It brought forgiveness into our lives where we had sin, where our lives were bound to addictions and things that held us captive. So when we decide that we want to choose to follow Jesus, it's making him Lord over every, every relationship in our lives. You know, there can be times that you have relationships or or you have conflict with people. And, you know, again, in this day and age, it's easy to just write people off. You know, I, I think sometimes there's people that go in cycles of relationships where, whether it's friendship or whatever, they have a conflict. Oh, we're going to the next person. Oh, we're going to the next person. But that never really heals the pain that you're dealing with in your heart that causes you to go to all those relationships. Again, it's by renewing our mind. It's taking one step at a time. Like, what does God's word even say about relationships? What does God's word even say about friendship? You know, the word says that you can find a friend that's closer than a brother, and that's Jesus. Jesus isn't ever going to fail us. We might not like the path he has for us sometimes, but he'll never fail us. And I'm so thankful for that. To be one of his children that means that we're something pretty special, right? right? The creator of the universe 
chose to have us formed in our mother's womb, chose for us to be created because we have a purpose and a plan in this world. So take one little minute and think about your life, like your whole life, you know, like all 18 years times whatever. (laughs) But think about your life (laughs) and think about the purpose that he created you for. And maybe you think, like, I'm not walking in what I know God created me for. It takes one step at a time. Today is the day that you can start walking in the purpose that God created you for. And it isn't to be in a vegetative state and have the plug pulled, right? right? Exactly. <laughs> and, and let me uh, just slip this in there, too. If, if you've gone through a divorce, don't be under condemnation because that's something the enemy tries to do. We understand that the pain of divorce has afflicted so many lives, so many homes. And, and God's aware of that. But uh, God brings healing and help to wherever you are at in your life situation. You know, and again, in any relationship, when there's conflict, you know, it's, and Pastor Matt shares this when he's speaking different times or when we're counseling with people, it's because somebody's being selfish. And so, again, take that step back. You know, lay down your life for the person that you're having conflict with. Think, how would Jesus handle this situation? In Romans 8, 12, It says, therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you'll die. And not just physically, but on the inside. If you're always pursuing sin and what sin has to offer. For if you live by it, you'll die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature... You will live for all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. So it's our choice to make Jesus the Lord of our life in every area of our life. Um, You know, one of the things that we did is we were planning for this is, you know, I looked up different things like what what are the reasons for divorce? Like. You know, years ago, it might have been different things than it is today. And, and so I actually found a website, and it was a website for people that are divorce counselors and people that um, help people after they've gone through divorce. And so it's statistics that this whole group of counselors put together. Um, they said that one of the reasons was failure to support one another in the good things that happen in life. Because you know what? I'm not married to Matt because we're in competition. Like, I'm excited for what God's doing in his life and and the things that God has for him. And and even as he's reading the word, you know, doing different things, like he'll say, hey, Deb, I read this this morning. Or he'll send me different articles or things like that. Like, that's exciting to me. You know, and then in real life kinds of things, on the job, when there's promotions, when there's things like that, if, if you come home and, you know, you talk to, you know, your wife and she's like, oh, well, good for you. You know what I was doing today? I was wiping runny noses and running to the grocery store and what? And I know I'm being stereotypical, so let's wipe that away. <laughs> but, you know, if, if those are the kinds of things, if your life doesn't seem as exciting as your, your husband's or wife you can still celebrate with them because remember, you're one flesh. You're one unit. You're not in competition. Her success is my success and vice versa. We, we share it together. Yeah, so next. Uh, next uh, on the list was incap- incapability, incapability in Incompatibility. finance. Incompatibility. Oh, there it is. Okay, yeah. See, that's why I need her. <laughs> So how does that word go again? I did go to school for, you know, speech and language pathology, so that helps sometimes. (laughs) Yeah. Anyway, it's when you you can't get on the same page financially, okay? (laughs) Yeah. Incapability, right? I said right there. Incompatibility. Incompatibility. Okay. All right. Now you know. Look at the word and sound it out. In. (laughs) Okay, I can make it bigger. Incompatibility. Yeah, it's right there. 
Okay. See, he tries not to use his reading glasses. I'm not sure why, but you know. <laughs> okay. Reading glasses? Incompatibility. I don't oh my, okay. okay, ready? Okay. Incompatibility. <laughs> um, in finances. In finances. You got that? I think they heard that. Okay. They know that. Okay. Uh, do we need to say any more? <laughs> It's, it's when you don't have agreement with major purchases or spending or, you know, it, or if she comes home and she, she spent this amount on groceries. At one point in our household, our grocery bill exceeded our house payment. And so she, what do we need all these groceries for? Because you have starving children that need to be fed. Okay. And so it's understanding those things. Okay. And uh, their friends. Oh, yeah, they're friends because they're friends with Like come Andy over too. Schultz, when he would come over, oh my goodness. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. Okay, all right. <laughs> communication issues is another one. And communication encompasses everything in the relationship sex, money, your schedule, uh, planning. In fact, one of the things, husbands, I don't know if you guys do this. But I never leave the house unless I let her know. I, like, if we're home on a Saturday, if I decide to run an errand or something. Never? Never? Ne never. Lawnmower? Well, that, I'm still home. Oh. He'll, like, actually sneak out of the house to mow the lawn. Because he would be on the lawn tractor all the time. And so he'll sneak out of the house to mow the lawn because I have a list of things he needs to do, you know? what he does. Uh, we call that the honeydew list. Yeah. But I got to cut the lawn before it rains, you know, kind of thing. Um, make hay when the sun shines, right? Okay. Anyway, uh, but, you know, just communication like that, you know, because you take off or something, and if she has no clue, well, you can call, find out, hey, honey, what, I just saw you leaving the house. What's going on here? But communication really is a skill that's developed. And, and communication is not talking at each other, but talking to each other. It's, it's allowing information to be shared and expressed so that understanding is the goal. All communications, the ultimate goal is to come to a place of mutual understanding, which brings us into harmony and agreement in our marriage. So I've been um, started a devotional by a lady named Dr. Carolyn Leaf. And she's a Christian neuroscientist. Doesn't that sound like really exciting? Well, it is. <laughs> she teaches us how our brain thinks and how we're wired and then aligns it with God's word. So that's the part that I really love. And one of the things that she says in communication, so like maybe you've had a week that it seems like there's a lot of communication flaws and this, again, doesn't just have to be husband and wife, but maybe somebody you work with or a roommate. To do these three things, to ask, to answer, and then to discuss. So asking a question like, like you really, did you have to go and mow the lawn now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, because it's going to rain tomorrow, and I won't be able to do it then. Okay, well, we discussed that, and now I understand. So, I mean, that's a kind of a goofy analogy, but, or, but ask, answer, discuss. Because you'll talk about the things that are important to each other. And it's really important to have those conversations, even about things that are not working. And this is something I, uh, a number of years ago I, I challenged the men with, and, and then... Uh, as we were meeting together with a group of men, I said, would you be willing to sit down with your wife and ask her, honey, is there anything that I can do to make this marriage better than what it is? And so that opens the door for honest communication. But you have to prepare yourself because you may hear things that you don't want to hear. But I also encourage wives to do the same. Honey, is there anything I could do that would make this marriage work better or more successful? Because that opens the dialogue for honest communication. Because otherwise, there's dishonesty in the marriage. You're not being truthful to each other and to yourself. So other reasons we talked about communication, 
Addiction is another main area that um, causes divorce and causes conflict in relationships. And addictions aren't just like drugs and alcohol. It can be things like pornography. It can be things like shopping. <laughs> it can be things like your phone. Not she pointed putting at me your, for that one. I don't know why. <laughs> not putting your telephone down. Social media. Addiction can be anything. But what that is saying to the other person is whatever that force is in your life is more important than me. And nobody, nothing should ever be more important to you than, first of all, Jesus Christ, and then the person that you're married to. And the last thing was adultery. You know, I guess I wasn't surprised to see that be something on the list. But adultery also takes on different forms. Adultery can be a physical relationship. It can be romantic relationship. It could be an emotional relationship where whoever you're married to is more connected with people they work with than they are with you. You have to put those, those um, barriers up when it comes to working relationships. And, you know, again, with the phone thing, like there's never a time that I can't take his cell phone anytime I want and read who he's been texting, what they've been saying, and the same he for me. Like that's not private for me. Because we share that. And so if you have issues with your spouse reading your phone, you might want to ask yourself, like, why? Because, again, everything I have is his and everything he has is mine. And there's not ever anything that we should be hiding from each other. So alongside of financial issues, adultery, um, those are the most common reasons. But... Any expert will tell you that having an affair, that's not the reason for the divorce. It's all the things that led up to making that choice. And, you know, one of the things, you know, depending where the situation is at with you, my word is take action. Don't let another day go by without dealing with what's at hand. Because so many times issues fester and what becomes like a, molehill turns into a mountain because it's something that has been unaddressed in the relationship. And so take action. Unresolved conflict. The Bible says don't even let the sun go down on your anger, your wrath. Deal with it before you fall asleep. At least, you know, ask God to forgive you and, and, and say we'll discuss this tomorrow, but let's, let's uh, forgive each other for this break here moment. Um, and other reasons... Uh, for uh, divorce would be lack of commitment. And you've heard me say many, many times that uh, total commitment results in total fulfillment. If you're not fulfilled in your marriage, maybe it's because you haven't totally committed to it. Um, lack of preparation before marriage. Not having the right information to prepare you for a lifelong together. Um, or unrealistic expectations. So many times, you know, and we actually have couples write down a list of expectations because if, if there's issues, do you expect me to do that? Oh, it comes as a surprise in the marriage because you come into a relationship with certain expectations. They must be discussed and talked about so there can be mutual agreement. And uh, also there's issues of um, physical, emotional, and verbal abuse, and sometimes that can be very subtle. But it's a very real thing. It's an issue that needs to be addressed and dealt with. Uh, one of the things I like to say is we need to divorce-proof our marriages. And, and that's a, a concept that maybe we could talk about at another time or at the Becoming One uh, conference. And, so the, and these are all things we talk about in premarital prep when we meet with couples. Uh, Deb and I invest in the couples that we marry. Uh, and it's not just me speaking into their lives. She's along my side, and we're speaking together to help that couple understand what marriage is and what they're getting themselves into. And premarital prep is a lot of fun, it guys. Is. You know, <laughs> um, you get to spend time with us or other couples in the church. You get to build relationships, and you grow in your relationship with each other. It's really worth the investment. So we talked about reasons 
that marriages don't work. So what are reasons that marriages do work? Because that's really awesome too, isn't it? Like, that's really awesome. So first of all, a marriage that works means that I'm not going to try to change my spouse. Even though he always wants to mow the lawn, I'm not going to try to change that, right? <laughs> it's a losing battle for me, right? Right. I won't change yeah. you. But really, he, you know, I don't want to be married to another me, right? <laughs> I want to be married to somebody who compliments me. And so not trying to change your spouse, to compliment them. You know, tell them they look nice, or they did a great job mowing the lawn, <laughs> or I'll get off the lawn mowing. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Um, but complimenting them for the, the gift that they are to you, thanking them for who they are in your life. I mean, just the little things, you know, like, Matt, I just love you so much. I'm so thankful for you and how you're my husband. You know, I'm thankful that you're committed to me. Like, we say those things to each other. You need to do those kinds of things. Love needs to be expressed and verbalized. We commit to not let one day go by without us expressing our love for each other. Even if it's like, I love you, honey. You know, um, in case I forgot to do it earlier. <laughs> <laughs> another, but no, we make it meaningful and, and real. Right? Another really good way to keep a marriage happy is to always take time to listen to each other. And we talked about that a little bit earlier. Another thing is to do projects together. You know, when he's mowing the lawn, I could be weed eating, right? No, I hey, couldn't. That's a great idea. Because <laughs> I, I don't would, like the weed eat. But I would probably really hurt myself and anybody who's near me because... I got some really I, nice goggles, honey. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, doing things together, like, you know, uh, we've recently shared how we, the lower level of our home, we've turned into an Airbnb. And so what that means is that people from all over the world come and stay at our house for weekends or a week, or we had one family for a whole month. But that's so much fun, and it's a project that we work on together. You know, we, um, I do my part of that, and he does his part. And so that's working on projects together, reading books together. We'll do things like that. Like, it's easy to listen to podcasts and stuff, but when we're reading a book together, we're both hearing the same thing, and those are opportunities for us to discuss those things. One of the things uh, that's important is have realistic expectations, especially if both are working outside the home. Then the household chores become, you know, responsibility for both of you to pitch in. It's not just the wife's role. That stereotypical thing needs to be banished from our thinking because you know, when we were growing up, you know, the uh, mom, she cooked the meals, she cleaned up, uh, she did all the house stuff, uh, dad worked, he came home, the meal was on the table, and all that. Now, thank God, guys actually cook. You know, thank God for the invention of the grill. <laughs> you know, that, that really helped in that department. But uh, she's not the only one that's making meals. Sometimes I'll make a meal, and it doesn't always turn out as good as hers. But, you know, it's a meal. Oh, and then I guess another uh, thing for successful marriage is understanding prayer, the importance of prayer together, the Word of God, going to church, serving together. Uh, it's growing spiritually together, uh, being equally yoked so that you can share spiritually on a level. And so often that's a, an issue in relationships where there's not a spiritual uh, connection. And so there's almost, spiritually, there's two different uh, lives. Uh, and that's a, a big part of a marriage relationship because a relationship is threefold. There's the mental aspect of the relationship. There's the physical engagement of the relationship. And then there's a spiritual uh, engagement in the relationship. Quality time is an important element to, uh, to make a successful marriage. Uh, one of the things, and as we bring this to a close, um, uh, there's a move in our culture uh, to redefine marriage. And, and I really feel it needs to be addressed from the pulpits of America. 
uh, people who believe that marriage was created by God, and I do, we do, and that it's defined by his word or in his word, the Bible, we don't debate in terms of people's rights. But in the design and the blessing that God created marriage to be. You see, we as human beings cannot redefine something that God has already defined. I will never do that. I will never go against the word of God. And even though there are people in a culture that are trying to do that, they are wrong. It's not a matter of civil rights. It's not a matter of, of people that are being taken advantage of unfairly. Uh, we're talking about biblical truth in a culture that is resisting and rejecting it. Uh, I, I could share a few more things. And, and it's important that we have compassion for those that don't believe or think the same way we do. But yet, we have to engage in the way that we can help show them the truth in a loving manner, not by beating the Bible over their head, not by condemning them, but by leading them first and foremost into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ because Jesus alone can transform a person. I can't change somebody's mind, but Jesus can transform a life if we lead them to find forgiveness and enter into relationship with him. So, you know, again, when we talk about relationships and marriage, like ultimately relationships fail, marriages fail because we don't take time to learn how to treat each other, to learn how to treat each other with kindness. You know, with, with sometimes people will talk way nicer to the people that they're at work with than they do to the person that they're supposed to love with all their heart. You know, think about the words that come out of your mouth, the things that you say to each other. And remember that if you're having conflict, you can't change the person, another person, but you can change you. Right. Right. What about me needs to change so that there isn't so much conflict? I can't always point the fingers to the other person because sometimes it's my reactions to what he says to me. And I don't have to have that kind of reaction. I can respond to things and have a kind voice and talk in a civil manner, not ignore each other, not slam doors, all that kind of stuff. You know, those, those are nonverbal ways to communicate, but those aren't tools that are healthy for a relationship. Other things, when we talk about grace, you know, um, like... If sometimes maybe I'm not being so kind to him and, and he's treating me like, why is he being like that to me? You know, I can think, why doesn't he have more grace with me? Well, um, sometimes I'm the one who needs to have grace for him, right? Maybe he's had a bad day. And so if I want grace extended to me, then I need to be willing to extend grace to the other person. And so what's a good definition for the word grace? Uh, grace, the most common one in the scripture we see is God's favor. But it's more than just favor. It's, it's God's reflection upon the human heart that makes a change in their life. It's, it's his enabling power that allows us to do what we can't do in our own ability. It's really God showing up. And, and allowing us to forgive like he forgives, to love like he loves. It's really to live out this gospel because you can be trying to live according to the do's and the don'ts and you will fail miserably until you encounter the grace of God because God's grace empowers you to live this life in Christ. In fact, uh, it's in Titus is a 2.12 that says, uh, the grace of God has appeared to all men teaching us to deny ungodly lusts and live this life in, according to godliness, to live a godly life. And I, I'm kind of paraphrasing it, but you can look that up. God's grace is so important. We need it. We, we're not saved without it. We can't save ourselves, but by the grace of God, we are saved. By the grace of God, we are who we are. 
And so because God extended grace and mercy to us, that means that we have the ability to extend grace and mercy to other people. And grace must be received. We must receive the grace of God. And then the transformation begins. So, you know, I, I think, again, investing in relationships is something that's so really important. And a few weeks ago when I talked, um, I talked about this, this seminar that we have coming up. And if you're sitting in this room and if you're married, I really want to encourage you to attend, even if you can only come part of the day, because it's worth investing in your relationship. And something that we do in premarital prep is any couple that, that in the last five years anyway we've started is that we encourage you to attend a marriage conference of some type once a year. And so we provide one right here. And so there's not an excuse. You don't have to get a hotel. You don't have to spend a ton of money. Of course, but it's that might be fun, though. It, oh, sure. It'll be, it, that would be fun. You can do that. <laughs> Um, but, you know, to know that we want healthy marriages in this church body. And if you're not married, you guys, I mean, to be able to attend something like this and to get that kind of, of knowledge from other people's experiences, and that, that's the way that this seminar is set up. We have four couples from the church that are going to be talking about their experiences in marriage. And so I'm going to share with you who they are. First of all, David and Dee Malik, they're going to talk about, um, they're not here today, but they're going to talk about bumps in the road in their relationship. And they had a season of life that they were at a fork. <laughs> they could have chosen divorce or to stay married. And it took a lot of time and hard work to make the choice to stay married. And so they're going to talk about all the little things, all those little foxes that came up that, that um, tried to destroy their marriage and how they made the choice they did. And then another couple, we have Jen and Dave Ray, and they're here today, but they're also going to be sharing. They're a couple that have weathered the storms of divorce. And so they're married to each other and doing awesome. But again, they apply the concepts and principles that they find in God's word. You know, and something about them, um, they're going to be talking about baggage and baggage that you can bring into a relationship, but you don't need to take a ton of time focusing on that baggage in the relationship, you know, getting over whatever that baggage is. So they're going to be sharing with us about that, about iniquities and inner vows and unforgiveness. Like, who doesn't need to hear <laughs> more about that kind of thing to keep it in the forefront of our mind? And then we have um, the K-Hearts, Sam and Mel, and they're going to be talking about doing the right thing, about blaming and fault-finding, the power of your words, and about complaining. Like, again, like, we can all learn from this stuff. And so invest in yourself invest in your marriage. And if the person you're married to really doesn't want to come, that's okay. You can still come. <laughs> Might cause an argument, but you can the come. Good. <laughs> we have ways you can serve, you know, and, and serve behind the scenes. Um, I just want to really encourage you to be part of this. And something I said earlier today at Team Rally with the volunteers is that usually around February is when you hear a lot of things about marriage. And then you hear about it again the next February. Well, August is like six months from February, so we're the weekend right before that. So you get your six-month booster shot when it comes to having an awesome marriage. All right. So coming up, what's that date again, honey? Do you know? Yes, July 27th. Yay! Saturday <laughs> from 9.30 to 4 p.m. And discount prices today, I think. For registration. Well, we want to bring this to a close. And, and a couple of the scriptures that I have, the first we see in Ephesians chapter 4. This is a charge and a challenge to all of us here today. Ephesians 4, verses 2 and 3 says, With all humility and gentleness, with patience, those are great qualities, aren't they? Bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. 
We must come to a place where we need to humble ourselves, where we need to recognize not only our need for God's intervention in our life, but to help us navigate in the relationships that we currently are in, especially when we're addressing husband and wife. This is, is so important. And um, as we look at what God wants to do, he wants us to establish a unity of the spirit to maintain that in the bond of his peace. For his peace becomes a bond in our homes to preserve, to protect, to help us succeed. Because I believe every marriage is to have a vision and is designed by God to bring significance into this earth. Not just offspring of children. That's so important. That's so eternal. But even more, what is it that God wants you to do on this planet through your marriage? And then finally, 2 Corinthians 13.1. Is our final greetings at the end of 2 Corinthians by the Apostle Paul. He says, finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Let's stand together. As we conclude, we want to pray. We want to pray for couples, for relationships. We also want to extend an invitation to you if you're here today and you've never made Jesus your personal Lord and Savior. You've never accepted him as the Lord of your life. We want to extend that invitation to you. So as you bow your heads this morning, I want you to think about this question. If you were to die today, do you have absolute assurance that you would go to heaven and be with Jesus? If you do, raise your hand. If you know, you know that you're in right relationship with God, you're in right standing with Him, you have that assurance. Okay, you can put your hands down. Now, there were a number of you that for whatever reason, you couldn't raise your hand. And I appreciate your honesty in that. And so, for that, we're going to lead you in prayer. And I call this a believer's prayer. It's a prayer that we can pray to receive, to acknowledge, and to accept Jesus as the Lord of our life. And so if you would pray that prayer with me, we'll just have everyone pray together. For those of you that couldn't raise your hand, we would like you to pray that prayer too and accept this invitation to receive Jesus as your Lord. Repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I come before you with a heart that's open. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner and I'm lost without you. Jesus, I believe you came to this earth to die for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead to give me new life. Lord Jesus, forgive me. I put my faith and trust in you Come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer sincerely, I believe God is moving right now to cleanse you, to fill you, to heal you, and to move on your behalf, to bring salvation, forgiveness of sins, and the gift of eternal life. Now, for those of you that are married. We want to pray for couples. And the prayer team is going to be up here. We're going to close on the song. And they'll be here to pray with anyone. But if you're here and your marriage is, is experiencing some turmoil, uh, be honest. Be open. Maybe you just need a little bit of help. Uh, we want to pray for couples today. And we believe God's going to meet you at your point of need. Thank you, Father. Father, we extend our hands over this congregation. We thank you for every married couple. We thank you for those engaged, for those building relationships, for even those desiring one day to be married. Oh, God, that you would release revelation, insight, and understanding to help us navigate through relationships. Help us to be connected with you, Father, so that we can connect with one another 
in the name of Jesus. We pray for healing, Father, concerning marriages that are struggling, that are hurting, that are in turmoil. Father, you are a God who helps when we face needs. We call on your name, and we declare victory over the marriages of this congregation. We speak strength, Father, to the marriages, to the families, to the households represented at Refuge. In Jesus' name, we give you praise. Amen. Are you ready to worship God? You know, we know that a family is only as strong as as the marriage. A church is only as strong as the marriages that make it up. A city is only as strong as the family. And the nation is only as strong as the family. And it all revolves around what God designed and created as marriage. We can't avoid it. We can't run from it. We can't get away from it. God bless you. Thank you for being so open and receptive to the word. Didn't my wife do a great job this morning? (laughs) 